Hi, this is Jen from How We End, and you are watching CMS TV. It's a little bit of Jet Boy right here on Chris Aiken Presents. And joining us right now is uh, the man himself, Mr. Billy Rowe. Billy, how are you, man? Good. How are you doing? Good, 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 man. And um, Just need I... to get Billy. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> doing great, buddy. All right. Well, dude, let's let's dig into this, man. Uh, we were talking before you came on about crate digging and about how, and, and I admitted it then, I'll admit it to you now, I hate covers albums generally. Just generally, because it's always the same tunes, you know, it's always the same 15 tunes. Mm -hmm. I love that you guys just dug in, found a bunch of Yacht Rock tunes and a bunch of other tunes that are just really not covered and did them, rocked them up, man. That, that is a great concept and a great idea, man. Right on. Thank you. Sure. So talk a little bit about that, man. What what went into the decision on the songs? Are you, are you a guy that sits around listening to you know, soft rock seventies type stuff or? Uh, yeah, I am. Absolutely. All those songs were a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, when it first came together, we didn't want to do, as they say, a karaoke record these days. It's just all the typical right. covers, you know? So do something out of the box. We work with Brian at, at Cleopatra and he's really good at this stuff, but I was, it was, you know, something I wanted to do is let's go towards more, the stuff we grew up on that's our generation of what our parents were listening to while we were discovering kiss and aerosmith in the 70s and those songs are incredible they're great timeless, timeless songs and the musicianship when you listen back and even try to learn some of those songs and transcribe them to guitar it's it's challenging yeah right on which one was the was the hardest to do or to do to conceive uh, guitar wise uh there was a lot of work in that super tramp song because a lot of that is like organ keyboard stuff right so jimmy who uh he did a lot of that guitar work um it was a lot of just kind of figuring it out and putting it together it was pretty did you guys keep the, the tunings um <laughs> the same as the originals or did you pick like a tuning for the whole record no uh, we did we did the same tunings pretty much you know even like rich girl if you listen and learn rich girl on guitar you really got to get transcribe it and it's just yeah it's it's all really just keyboards and bass and drums you know totally did were there were there any songs that that and this is probably more a mickey question but were there any songs that we were just talking before like even Lido shuffle both of us did not know the lyrics to it at all and we had to pull up the lyrics to We've been singing something completely different. Were there songs in this that that you guys, when you were doing them, even even when you heard Mickey doing them, you were like, "Wait a minute, that's not what the lyric is." Uh, yeah, I think I'm sure. I, I'm sure for Mick, you know, uh, for sure, there's stuff that you probably read in the lyrics. Go, oh, I didn't know that line. You know, that's what they said or whatever. So, right. Um, but for me, yeah, lyrics are a tough one. You really got to dig in, and especially stuff when you hear it as a kid. Right. Uh, make up words sometimes you really don't know what those words are anyways, you know. So right. you kinda Are you more a person that identifies with the music or are you like a lyrical person? Because there is yeah, a different humanity. I, I, was, I was always more just a, like the riff and music yeah. and melody. Me too. The melodies yeah. for sure like suck yeah. me in, but like the lyrics were almost secondary for me where but yeah. I noticed that there are there is a large 
group of people that the lyrics are super duper important to them and he, they'll even sacrifice some musicianship if the if the lyrics yeah. have depth so I, I guess we have to be mindful of those things more right right <laughs> you know? I, I, pay, I pay attention to more to the lyrics now right and like now it more stands out and kind of just you know you get into songwriting and stuff and you sure you've lived a little and now that it resonates yeah, a little yeah. more some of the lyrics in, from those songs you grew up with yeah when you get into writing there's a lot of words that will flow better that mean the same thing or will put across the same message sure know? there's a lot of thinking that goes into it's a craft you know you, you could do a more thoughtful way or a more hateful way whatever is required right. of your band depending it's... on what kind of music you play <laughs> speaking of which we were we were talking about jet boy earlier and mm -hmm. just the um conception of the band and and the image put forth in the beginning we wanted to know how that worked out did it meet people's expectations were they thrown off at all from the image versus the sound of the band what do you remember about that time period coming up well, yeah, in the early, like the very yes, early stage. Well, we yeah, for the for the local scene that was going on in San Francisco, we were definitely a few steps ahead of reviving the whole New York Dolls glitter mm -hmm. rock kind of glam thing back. So, but we were taking it to, you know, we took it to a different level because we were inspired by Hanoi Rocks. You know, I always go back to that band because they really inspired that whole era, whether right. it was Motley Crue or. Or, or Rat or GNR and Jet Boy and Poison, you know, they just that image was just striking. And uh, did did you think your music sounded like like? Because we were just talking about this before you came on. I remember seeing you guys. I don't remember who it was with, maybe Poison or somebody. <laughs> and I complain, and I didn't know the music at the time. I mean, I had heard Feel the Shake, but that's all I had heard. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing the band and I was thinking it was going to be like a Hanoi Rocks clone because of the look. Because I had mm -hmm. seen you guys in like Hit Parade or something. Yeah. And then hearing you guys musically, I was like, this is totally not that. It, it, right. it, to me, it doesn't sound like that at all. Was was mm -hmm. that what you were trying to go for? Or? Uh, you know, I think, yeah, I think with some of those bands, the image was a big part of, uh, was one part of what we were influenced by and then musically there was a, another thing because you had five guys in the band we were all into everything from priest right. to maiden to Hanoi rocks to the clash to the sex pistols to kicks to right the, the cheap trick so you know what in the early days a lot of our music was a lot faster it was a little more punk a little more just reckless and you know riding off the rails just just kind of just going for it. we really didn't know what we were doing we we're just <laughs> wanted to be a <laughs> you know but then when the records came out if you're talking more like feel the shake era yeah <clears throat> when that came around that was like a big evolving part for us by the time we got signed we had been you know the songs got a little bit slower they got a little more acdc riffage um and they got a little just just very, what label really? we were originally on we were signed to electra records right? electra okay electra now was there like a handler for for electra that was to, you know telling you guys to do certain things or pushing you in certain directions that yeah you well we got signed to electra uh they basically part was of course go in and rehearse and just start writing songs okay so right. by the time we got to deciding working with the producer tom allen we worked with by the time we got to that point, we had written probably another 10 songs. And you know what it's like when you're in a band and you write new songs, you're all about the new stuff. Yeah. Right. You know, so we went, you know, we demoed all the stuff we had at the time when we signed with Electra. And that was like, I think that was 86 or whatever. And then by the time we did the record, I think two songs from that 18 song demo that we did to, you know, to basically make a demo, to send to producers, et cetera. The only two songs ended up on the record. It was all new stuff. And it was, it was a little bit of the, it was a lot of the label actually, mm -hmm. the producer and the guiding and this, 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 this band could be on the radio and all the yeah. BS that you would just hear that really at this point, you know, I, I used to kind of fight against that. I'm like, who cares about the radio and <laughs> what we're about? It's like, I really do. I, I really didn't understand that. I didn't grow up with the, I grew up with the radio, but I didn't, I bought records because I saw the album cover and it was in, in sure. the record stores, you know, it was more word of mouth and underground, which what, that's what rock and roll was back then. Right. On. It was pretty great timing though. I mean, with, um, 
you know, Headbangers Ball, of course, I remember uh, Feel the Shake coming out and thinking it was super cool. And as you said, the image, I love how, how the band was shaking it up compared to how a lot of the hair bands were starting to possibly get around there and kind of got right. away from that. But it was, still had flash to it, you mm -hmm. know, and it was a cool video when it, when it kicked in. It had an ACDC yeah. kind of feel. And right. I was on, remember being on board with it. Same. I love the Mohawk. I yeah. mean... I loved uh, Beyond Thunderdome. I loved the Mad Max movies. I liked uh, the punk rock <laughs> yeah. image. So anything remotely like that had my attention. And it was, yeah, uh, we, it was we awesome. definitely stood out because of Mix Mohawk. And, you know, we really, we, you know, we were part of that scene, but, you know, GNR had that place and like we did as well. It had, it, there was a handful of these bands like Faster and GNR, Jet Boy, and even LA Guns, but that we had one foot in punk rock. Mm -hmm. Right reckless and kind of you know roughness versus some of the other bands that came around that were around that time from polished and stuff too they were polished. more polished and more you know pointy headstocks uh, <laughs> right. you know and, and even their look was different you know i mean there really was it was just a little more you know spandexy or something you know sure. ours was you know tight leather pants you know that you <laughs> right took in yourself and creepers and colored socks and <laughs> you know, it just had this more of a a, a punk vibe to it. You know, sure. what, what do you remember about get, having the video play on Headbangers Ball? I mean, that had to be a pretty big deal for you. <clears throat> oh, I, yeah, I remember that. I remember when we were in New York and we did Headbangers Ball with with Adam Curry, and uh, yeah, that was a big deal. We waited up. I remember it was funny because our video and the Bullet Boys Smooth Up Indie, I guess it was, were both debuted neck to neck, neck to neck, the set like back to back <laughs> on Headbangers Ball that night. Wow. Dude, what, being from San Francisco, were you an Omni guy or a Stone guy? Uh, uh, stone. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Why? The Omni, on, honestly, the Omni, I guess the Omni was around. The Omni really wasn't around when we started playing the Stone. Okay. I don't think it was It was the Keystone. You had the Keystone Berkeley. Yeah. And then he had the Keystone uh, Palo Alto. So we would do the Stone and Palo Alto. And I don't think it was till I want to say it was when uh, uh, Nady took over that the Omni really became more of a place. Right. I could be wrong because it was it was more of the East East Bay metal was really but the metal thing, you know, I guess it I guess it was, you know, our era, the early Jet Boy days when we we're doing the Stone and the Babuha and the on Broadway, Ruthie's Inn was the, the head. Yeah, Ruthie's. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell people about that place all the time. That was a dangerous place. Ruthie's, if mm -hmm. if, if you caught the wrong show, and, and God help you if you caught an Exodus show and you wore a Poison shirt or a Jet Boy shirt or something, you would get your ass beat. It was, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. It was tough in there, man. Yeah, Closers die. Yeah. That was a quote from Bailoff. Yep. It was, it was, and, and it's funny because he was like all, like <laughs> all those other guys were like down with that. You know, they mm -hmm. all kind of were secretly you know i guess when they weren't on stage they all were listening to the same music but on stage it's like oh the posers yeah. you're a poser you're a poser yeah and for the bay area for for myself i came from i mean i grew up in the city and so i was i was super into the metal scene so you know old friends like ron quintana and ian callen all these guys rampage radio and sure i was you know i was in that and used to I'm going to see Saxon and Motorhead in '81, and I was hardcore. So when I went all glam and Jet Boy, you know, we I was friends with a lot of these guys. So we were the one band that was uh, whatever allowed they, to be that. They, that that people still dug because it was it still was reckless and punk at the time, you know. Right. And I always tell people, well, you know, that, where do you think they met their wives at the Jet Boy shows? <laughs> right. There was nice. no chicks at their gigs. <laughs> <laughs> too funny man well dude let's fast forward a little bit um you guys kind of put the lineup back together and you did born to fly in what 18 or 19 yeah um how how was the reception to the to that incarnation of the band and i guess it was kind of short-lived because covid killed you guys like everybody else no yeah pretty much yeah uh-huh <clears throat> that was the response to that record was great it was out of the blue we did not you know, I always said, let's write music and let's write, you know, we did that EP and we've written stuff and put it on like a bonus track on some of these Cleopatra releases and stuff. But uh, when we got approached to do a full record, it was, you know, everybody was a little like, oh, really? And I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do this, you know? And I was, right. I, I got really into writing my own, just with, I was in the band American Heartbreak and right. 
I got really into like recording with Logic and just for my own personal fun and enjoyment because I like I like to write stuff. I would write stuff, so I got good with that. So I just started putting a, a compiled tons of riffs, and they basically structured into songs. And I started giving him the mic, and he would fire back within a day or even hours of like I got it, you know, boom, done. And then we demoed them all, and it just started. To, once we knew this was happening. With that record, it just started flowing, and it, myself, Fern, and, and Mick, you know, the, there was always a chemistry there. Right. We just basically put on the old hats that we used to do and didn't mm -hmm. try to reinvent anything. Let's just do what we're good at and what we're known for and just try to just do it as if it would have been our third record. Right. And that's and kind of what a lot of the response was. I mean, I guess it, it does come across like that, you know? Yeah. Well, it, I, I just remember when it first came out, A, like everybody else, I was like, whoa, this is out of the blue. You know, I, I, I did not expect it at all. And then it was it was really, really good. But then, like everything else, COVID kind of killed it. Yeah. Like, it, you know, it, for, for you guys, when COVID really settled in and you didn't get the chance to get out there and play as much as you would have liked to, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. did you got, did you consider putting the band back on hiatus or do you not even consider Jet Boy in the we're active and we're not active terms? Uh, yeah, we were, I mean, you know, we've always been active in, in, in our own way. We've always just kind of just everybody's lives when it worked they came together and we were able to do stuff and then everyone went off to do their thing. Mm -hmm. Then never just reached that height of touring and, and popularity of just being able to go out there and really do a proper tour. We, we right. did a tour though. You remember <laughs> we did. Yeah, we did that tour with Piercy and, the, and mm -hmm. that worked at the time, you know, it was, it was real fresh when we got back together. So the right. Was, That's what I was going to say. Uh, it's like a reunion for you guys, if I recall. Yeah, exactly. But you know, to, to continue that we wanted to do more when that Born to Fly came out, it was just it, it's just tough. Wasn't it like a? I try to remember this stuff because we used to go out a lot in the winter time. It seemed like yeah, uh, it Pierce Man because through a lot of the years, Stephen was in Rat at the same time, and they would do the bigger like summer tours, yeah. and then Piercy would go do a last minute like November December tour, January oh. February, where it's brutal in most parts of the country. You know, it's mm -hmm. going to be blizzards, ice treacherous and yeah. uh, that was where the piercy band thrived in that zone and we would go out <laughs> and i remember we'd take you know your bang tangos and jet boys and you know metal church mm -hmm. at one point i think um uh -huh. do you remember what do you remember it was you guys us and do you recall any other bands on it um was this the xmas was this the, i want to say didn't didn't you have another one of your band that was on it as well oh yeah 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 that's right I played twice. Yeah, can i forget i played twice i had the anti-division that's right which was kind of a punk rock kind of same idea where i was trying to keep a foot in a punk yeah. rock kind of place right. uh which wasn't very well received with steven piercy people they wanted to hear <laughs> rat they right. wanted to hear you know it, it was really rough and i also uh realized pretty quick that i'm not a singer i mean i could do background vocals no problem but like mm. to actually be the main guy having to sing every night i blew my voice out pretty quick on that thing and right. realized i should just probably stick to guitar just do it some right. uh -huh. uh, <laughs> backup vocals but it was cool to meet you guys back then. I thought you were all really good dudes. And I was super stoked when I saw that you got the Buck Cherry gig. I thought that was yeah. so yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. I want to hear all about that, like how that came to be. Uh, well, I, I go back with, uh, I've known Stevie for quite a while. Okay. <clears throat> and um, I knew the previous bass player. And, you know, so we've crossed paths and all that. Um, they hit me up actually a few years back is when COVID, it was before COVID. Okay. And I was still in San Francisco. I relocated my guitar business to LA about almost almost five years ago now. And it just, the thing wasn't just, it wasn't lining up right. But then when COVID hit, I was at the shop and Stevie just sent me a text. Um, Do you sing backups, backup vocals too? And I'm right. like, uh, yeah, I, I did with Jet Boy. Yeah. What's, you know, and then it led to, then he called me and just told me what was going on that <clears throat> COVID hit. They wanted to try to, you know, keep active and, and get out there. And, uh, the other guitar player who had replaced Keith, mm -hmm. um, just wanted to back out. He didn't want right. to do her whatever. And he's like, I know you got your business, your guitar business, but I think, you, you know, you're the guy for this gig. Okay. 
And I, I just, you know, I, I said, yeah, like, I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no. I said, it's, it's an opportunity. It's kind of what I always really was hoping for. Mm-hmm. I want to move to LA to get my shop up and running, hire a crew and, and run it and then be able to get into a band that was touring and active that I can get in and just kind of, you know, be, you know, a hired guy and just, you know, with a paycheck basically. Sure. <clears throat> you know, bringing up that tour too, if I remember right, Buck Cherry was one of the very first bands during COVID to, to do like extended touring, not do, yeah. not do, you know, one show this week and then another the next week. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you guys, cause I, I, I remember on, on classic metal show when I was, when I was doing that, talking about that tour and about how it was like four and five nights a week during COVID mm-hmm. that w- was that. I don't want to say scary, but was that intimidating given the way the world was, you know, as far as health concerns and just would people right. come out and all that stuff? Uh, well, I mean, when I, when I, when I took it on, I was, you know, I knew for me it would work perfect because I knew it was going to be just a, a handful of shows to kind of get acclimated in this new climate we were in right? with the world. And I was all for it. I wasn't, I, I don't, I didn't have the, the chicken little in me. As, <laughs> right. As, right. I'm like, fuck it, I'll go out there and, and let's do this. It's like, I, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't worried about anything. And everybody else wasn't. They wanted to go work and said, this is what we got to do. And, you know, I guess I'm cut from that same cloth. <laughs> right. So it worked out, you know, and we did do a handful of shows. There was like a handful at first and then a tour was booked and it still kind of flew under the radar. But we went out and did, a, you know, a good run of shows. And yeah, it was like 30 or something, right? It was like an extended run. That. Yeah. Probably more than that. Yeah, because I, 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 I just remember at the time, and, and, <laughs> and, and people have probably don't remember now because we've all tried to purposely forget that time, but right. at the time, all we were seeing was like live stream shows and stuff. Yeah. This band's on live stream, and then there's, here's Buck Cherry, and here's a list of shows, and it's like, boom, down the page. I was like, Boy. damn. You yeah. guys are ambitious. Right. Yeah, we did that live stream first. And then what you realize is when you go out there and we did that through all of that, that whole era, you realize, which if, if you don't tour or well, you got to kind of live different places, but all the, all these states are governed differently. Oh, yeah. They, they run them how what works for that state and what that state's about. So some of them were, were, were open. There was not as big of an issue in some. So that's kind of the pockets we went to. And honestly, everything was fine. Sure. But, you know, I sure. Mean, did people get sick. Yeah, people get sick. You know, did those would be the die? red states, I would imagine. <laughs> He's talking about red states. Yeah, red I mean, states, in, 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 I guess in a sense it could have been, you know, but at, yeah. at the same time, I think some of these states just, they do, whether what side they go with, they kind of run sure. differently. They all run differently, you know, so. No, it must be interesting like the the crowds of buck cherry i'm just guessing that they're more leaning toward the female side especially since they've had the crazy bitch song uh-huh. it seems like there is no shortage of crazy bitches out there that that's their jam <laughs> you know? and i was just like how is that how are these shows like when that song comes on to like is there like mostly a female audience that goes nuts every night for that uh, like, actually believe it or not you know the the, the band is it's got a really hardcore and then pretty devoted fan base it's pretty sure. cool. okay i'm really never really there is there's this thing with this band that i've experienced like the new guy coming in i followed the band i was always a fan of the band sure of other bands it's like kiss fans you know they're fanatics you know or green day fans they're just like they're down for life and that's how i, I that's what i get out of this band which is pretty pretty amazing to have you know right so um, that's cool. you get a lot there's a lot of guys into this band there's a lot of the biker sure. scene that's very into it but there's a lot of just you know blue collar hard working people who are raising a family people yeah. who just love this band you know i mean there's i think there's been two two guys that proposed at a meet and greet wow <laughs> to each other yeah the, the the guy proposed to the to his you know, girl, the, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant like a gay like, couple. Like actually, like you know, they're and they're both massive like Buck Cherry fans. You know, oh, so okay, he cool. Was reciting like song titles and lyrics and stuff. To ah, the ah. It's incredible. Yeah. You know. That Hopefully, is- it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 but, so, but when Crazy Bitch goes off, you see everything. I mean, when we when that song clicks, 
when we when we when it starts it, it's like a light switch goes off in right. some of these people's eyes i don't know what it is sure but it clicks with with all both men and women guys sure. girls, yeah. a little bit. and and then i'm seeing a lot of younger kids showing up to these shows i'm talking like 18 to 21 maybe that wow. are, most of them are in the front row so there's a there's a wave of that song that has crossed over like almost two generations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some of these shows are like uh i mean there's you got the the average fan base of who grew up on buck cherry you sure. got this new fan base that they're kids right sure which is, which is cool because that's what you saw with the 80s rock you saw that with kiss and eros mm -hmm. fans so no, I don't know if you saw. Well, you probably did, but earlier in the show, uh, I have a fill-in that we that I have to hire on occasion when I have other business to tend to, and I can't make it on time. The Chris Aiken presents. His name's Stoic Steve, and he got a call that he's uh, got an opportunity to try out for Slipknot because their mm -hmm. drummer left. We don't know why. We were like, uh, I, those guys were speculating earlier on what it could be, uh -huh. but a, as a as a guy who came into a band that was already established. Did they lay down any rules for you to abide by in this band or things they frown upon or anything? Or, or were you just such a, you know, modest, cool guy that they didn't have to worry about it? Uh, well, I guess, you know, not, not really rules. I talked to Josh right away, you know, first thing. And, uh, you know, they're all sober. The band's sober. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the band. And so so drinking, on. drinking's off the table, obviously. Well, you know, the, the crew drinks. Know. I mean, you know, sometimes we got to carry the crew with a couple crew guys and throw them in their bunks. You know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> everybody, everybody's got many years behind them that it's, it's, you know. Sure. Same with us, you know, Piercy Band. I don't know if people realize, but Stephen hasn't drank in years, and yeah. I've always been supportive of that. And even though. When you guys tour with us, I was probably drinking like a fish with the other guys. That's like the yeah. old days in our mind. I mean, I've been in the band 23 years and probably stopped drinking 13 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, where, um, and I don't need to, you know, I used to be kind of nervous going out and playing in, in front of big crowds, but after you do it enough times, it's really nothing. Your body gets used to shut the fear out or whatever. And I didn't really need to drink anymore. And it's not a thing. I probably play a lot better now than I did uh yeah. when i was drinking so it's not a big sacrifice you know right right yeah and for me like i told josh i was like i'm sober as well so you know and he's like mm -hmm. fit right in and that's perfect so great sure. just do the job you know I, sure. I i know how to do this you know i've done it before i get it i know that, that you know i used to run jeppo i did all the business so i know the whole how to deal with all that stuff sure. you know, i know my place i know where the line right. is but it's 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 become like a band you can feel there's a uh, a thing with this lineup sure it's long great it's just it's 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 solid you know there's something mm -hmm. you just feel it live and you hear it from people who who you meet out there you know sure. the fans and stuff so which is cool so is is um, how much creative and i'm going to the albums i guess but how much creative input do you have like like with with hellbound as you know which i know you played mm -hmm. on do, do you have creative input on that because and the reason i'm asking is because you know if you listen to the first buck cherry record to the last buck cherry record you don't hear a whole lot of you know it's very ac dc ish in that it sounds you know the the albums fit they don't they don't have that wild alternative era of the band or whatever mm -hmm. you yeah. know there's a very set style yeah. And that, that to me, must be difficult for a guy like you, who's been kind of the creative leader of the bands that you've been in mm -hmm. previously. So do you have any kind of input in that, or do you just play uh, what's required or what? Yeah, I just I just play what's required. On, on Hellbound, when I came in, that record was pretty much written. Okay. <clears throat> so it was, uh, you know, I, I put a couple snippets and slide stuff and some songs, you know, a couple tunes. That's another thing that I was able to bring in because the original guitar player, Keith, the founder with Josh, he was a slide guy as well. So I can really slide in and, and keep that, that, that vibe of, of Buck Cherry, you know, now with the creative stuff, it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's Josh and Stevie. Now I, I get all that stuff. It's like, if they want me to work, you know, I've, I've submitted some riffs. Stevie's asked me and stuff, but I, I understand it's like, how that dynamic works you know i'm not gonna like push you know hey what about this or whatever it's like if they want me to ride with them i'll ride with them if not it's like 
I'm busy as can be with my guitar company. It's like I, you know, it's not like. I Tell us about this guitar company. You have my ear, my friend. What's this guitar yeah. company? Like? Oh, I started a guitar company about. Oh God, it's going on. It's probably closer to twenty years than fifteen. Uh, rock and roll relics. Okay. So uh, they're custom builds. You know, it's a brand. You know, I got like five models. Uh, is is it a brick and mortar? Or is it online? Where well, what is it? it? We're basically we're a factory, so we sell to stores. We sell direct. Okay, pull it up, Chris. Um, let's let's awesome. see if they relic yeah, guitars. What? What's the website? Rock, rock, the brand is called Rock and Roll Relics. So the whole thing I got into the whole aging of, you know, taking guitars and making them look old. It, mm -hmm. You know, it's doing like basically Tellys and Strat styles, which we still we still do, but we're more in. I've got my own shapes now. Uh, I got a hollow body. You do I do like a double cut cut is like the classic mm -hmm. the model. Um and it, it's we saw just, an early picture of you, it looked like you had a Gretsch Falcon back in the yeah, day. Yeah, that was my that was my thing back in the day, the hollow body. How did you get that guitar back then? Uh, well, was huge, huge it was fan. expensive, right? I mean you know, back then I paid fifteen hundred bucks for that in nineteen yeah. so that was a lot, I guess, for Hell a time. Yeah. Oh yeah, well, we got signed to Electro. We each got two grand, and that's what I bought. <laughs> wow, that's a cool story. Yeah, yeah good, good investment though. I mean, compared yeah, to like yeah, party or buying leather. No, here in a case. It's been in there for years. You still have it? Yeah, it's really sitting right here. Oh, that's cool, man. <clears throat> well, join our hit list. There yeah, look at that. Pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, so I, you know, I got people like you know, like Billy Joe Armstrong's a big supporter of me. He plays my stuff. He's been playing it for years. Nice. Um, I got like uh, uh, Johnny Resnick from the Goo Goo Dolls is another one who's a big guy. Ryan Roxy's been pushing my stuff big time. Wow. But we got stores. Um, yeah, we, we we build probably like, you know, close to 200 a year we sell. Wow. Um, and it's just getting bigger. We also, are you familiar with Friedman Amps? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Fried, Friedman's got guitars. You know, you've been familiar with his guitars? Sure. Yeah. Um, I have seen it. Yeah, we we took we, Grover Jackson used to build them, but he moved to Tennessee and is kind of kind of going on retirement mode. And uh, we took over, so we build all those as well, okay. which we do about we do we do about twenty a month of those. So we're doing a few hundred of those. Get that second one, Chris. This the one, green, the green the greeny. One? Yeah, yeah, that's the Lightning model. Oh, that's pretty that. sick. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, now, uh, Billy, how, how how much input do you actually have in into it? I mean, are, do you do you have both a uh, input in the actual look of these things as well as you know the the playability and yeah, how they? Get, I mean, these are all you know we 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 CNC these. You know, they're all cut. They're all our designs, and uh, everything is. Yeah, I do uh, at it before I was in the band and Buck Cherry. Yeah, I was I was the main painter. I paint all the I you know okay. paint all. Mm -hmm. wow. do all the binding, wrap the binding, glue the necks, the whole. The, I could know. tell just looking at the neck, like those frets, that that those guitars feel amazing. I could just tell by yeah. looking at it. Yeah, they're they're good. Well, oh. I'll just tell you, Billy. I I own business, not guitar businesses, obviously, but I own businesses, and you would have to pretty much come and drag me out to get me to stop working on my businesses is it hard to leave this even though you trust the people that you work with is it hard to leave it for a month two months three months to go and do buck cherry at, at, at first it was a little you know a little scary at first um but i know to grow what i'm doing especially with something like this that's hands-on and the building I can't do everything. I got to a point where it's like my arms or my elbows are getting blown out from just the you know, work I do with stuff, just sanding and just gluing. You know, it's it's physical too. Right. And How do you so get people to work for you? Though? Guy. I had a, one guy full time for years, and then we moved to LA, and he came with me, and then I hired another guy when we took on Friedman, and then I just slowly, once I, you know, then I hired this painter to help paint. And once I did that and I, I stepped away, I was able to, the, the business grew. Yeah. And so I was These able to let go of certain things. I was like, I can't do everything. The only way to grow is to let go. <laughs> right. You know, it really is. Les Paul Jr. was play. These are like the Billy Joe ones he probably uses, right? He's got, he's got one of everything. Tell you the truth. So these are badass. You start off with one of these, you know, that's our thunders model. The hats off to uh, Johnny thunders. Yeah. Um, 
then our Starfighter model is kind of my ode to, to Malcolm Young. You know, it's a, it's a carved top. Mm -hmm. And the uh, lightning and then the revenge, the offset is kind of that's the first one we just moved into our own complete our own, our own shape. Right. And that uh, lightning's pretty cool. I've never seen that done for holes. On a, yeah. On a mm -hmm. So, so yeah, this cool. is but for, call me stupid, but I always thought that these guitars were just worn out. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, I see the wear on them like this, I always thought that they were just worn out from being used on. I didn't realize no, it was a no. painting style. I know it did. thing through years, you know, it's like I, I, I've always, I, I'm not into new and shiny and it's just, it's not right. rock and roll for me. It's like rock and roll is beat up and dirty. And right. You know, what about your car? What about, tell us about your car. Do you, does your car also beat up too? Cause no, that's, but that's if I had the, if I had the time and, uh, <laughs> I would have an old car and I would have it beat up. I, I'm, in, I'm really into like old Honda CBs from the 70s. And I have a few CB 360s and 350s, and one of them is just totally hammered. I did. Uh, I relicked my uh, 2018 Nissan Rogue by backing into a pole a couple times. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it was a style move. <laughs> nice well well billy pulling it back around to jet boy you've got the new record that um crate, crate digging um what are the plans are there plans are you going to have time to do anything other than just release it uh we, we i just you know mick and i talk about it because mick and i are the only original ones left and just you know with both our lives being his life is busy as well with work two kids Mm -hmm. just let let the opportunities what comes up in front of us show wise uh just guide where we're going to go with it you know it'd mm -hmm. be nice to go out and, and do a tour i can't do everything anymore with what i'm doing if i, yeah. if I could do shows i will if not i got a sub who fills in for me you know they did about stoic steve what's that <laughs> <laughs> that's probably an inside joke to you billy but yeah. stoic steve is a fill-in he's on our show earlier today and he just fills uh, in for anything he's gonna he's gonna see if he can get the drum gig but he also does guitar and different stuff but uh right. don't worry but we'll move well we won't uh, yeah. waste time on stoic yeah they did a few shows without me last uh this year and then okay. they're coming up with junkyard in february that they'll, they'll i won't be able to do that but you know if, if i could do it i'll do it i did a few shows at the beginning of this year do you do you think there'll be like opportunities like like an M three maybe or a Rocklahoma or stuff like that? To, yeah, to we get did. Up? There was one this year that it was two. We did the Rock Island, the one in Key West. So I did that one at the beginning of the year. We did that with okay. it was us and enough's enough, and I don't know. I think Pretty Boy, Pretty Boy Floyd or something. Um, that okay. was on the day we did. Um, I did that one. I did a whiskey show, and then they did this one out in oh I don't remember where it was, but it was. Brett Michaels was headlining. Okay, so I'm sure some festivals will come up, and hopefully, with this uh, the release of this record, that usually strikes up, uh, you know, brings the name a little, brings it up a little bit for awareness, you know. Sure. Would Would you be interested at all in doing any of the cruises, Monsters of Rock, or any of that kind yeah, of we stuff? Did, we did Monsters of Rock right before I joined Buck Cherry. We actually did. Monsters okay. Of Rock. So we did that in 20, I guess 17. Okay. Yeah. I would think Buck Cherry is going to keep you so busy, though. I mean, they yeah, they'll be busy. We got we got stuff going up. You know, it's it's there's been a lot of touring, so it's been kind of on the path of uh, of you know kind of spreading some putting some time in between, stuff, right? Which I think is a good idea, and and just kind of try to focus on more support stuff. On uh, you know, we're doing these so runs with Skid Row right now, which have been great. Yeah. seeing the difference in everything from just attendance to merch to the, the overall just the the uh you know sure how only because i haven't seen him do it yet myself mm -hmm. um how how is eric gronwell as a as a singer to see every night is he is he the spitting image of he's classic great. skid row he's his voice is is yeah it's pretty pretty great he's he doesn't he doesn't look like him you know he's right mohawk you know but he's got his own thing i like what he does he's 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 definitely great on stage he's he's got good banter in between and i i yeah i've seen the band many times with the original lineup and the album lineups and this is definitely by far the best there's there's they got uh a same thing there's something going on with them a the chemistry mm -hmm. and, but right he on. does if you go see it it's i wouldn't miss it if you're a skid row fan you know it's uh it's close as it's been 
Very sure. cool. I was a Skid Row fan. I um I, I saw them when they opened Bon Jovi. They opened for Bon Jovi for their first tour. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bon Jovi put me to sleep, but Skid Row were awesome. They filmed 18 in Life here in San Diego. And uh-huh. San Diego Sports Arena. They only ended up using like a two second snippet of it right. in the video at the very end. But uh, I always loved Skid Row, and all the guys were pretty notable in the band. Mm-hmm. So it would make sense that they would continue on. And, uh, you know, best luck to Eric Romal. I hope they continue to have Buck Cherry playing on those shows because that's an amazing package right there. Yeah, it's been great. You know, I mean, I go back with all those, you know, the original guys. We were all buddies in the 80s. So this has been something we've been, you know, wanting to do with Jet Boy in the past. So just me, you know, touring with them. It's kind of like a, a reunion of friendship, you know, for, through all these years. So it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely, man. Well, dude, obviously, man, it's great to have a Jet Boy release um, th- with the crate digging, um, a, a great yeah. covers release. Is there, I'll ask the question and I know the answers, we'll wait and see, but I'll ask it anyway. Is there uh, any new Jet Boy, like original Jet Boy stuff on the on the near or maybe even later horizon? Uh, there's nothing, nothing really written. There's, there's okay. thoughts of it. I've, I always mention it to Mick. Uh, cause I love doing it. I love just writing stuff. I do have a handful of ideas that I will be sending him. And, uh, so I'm sure we'll put something out. It's like nowadays it's so, it's really so easy. All you got to do is put the effort in and, 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 and want to do it. And you could put stuff up online, you know, songs. It doesn't have to be a record. Yeah. You know, there's tons of avenues. You don't even need a label. You could just put it up there and, uh, yeah just let it go right on man well it's great it's great stuff that the album the current album is called crate digging when is it out officially i believe november 23rd okay so a few weeks just in time for thanksgiving right yeah i guess so yeah Yeah, covers on it it was definitely a fun one you know a little gary glitter dream weaver rich girl there's there's some yeah it's it's it's, the songs i've heard are a lot of fun and it's it's you know, and again, just like we said at the beginning, what what makes it fun to me is that it's it's not Freebird, it's not Sweet Home Alabama, it's not the ones that are just done and done and done and done. Mm-hmm. You know that that's what makes it fresh is putting mm-hmm. a rock spin on songs that are clearly not hard rock, right. which that makes it fun. Yeah, there's a couple on there we did since you've been gone. Uh, is that is a uh... rainbow? rainbow um yeah. and we did do dancing in the moonlight and that one actually features sammy off on bass okay and it features if you're familiar with a band called biters uh this guy by tuck smith fantastic if you don't know who they are they're great but biters are no longer but he went solo he's a great songwriter okay he's vocals in the verses and then if you're familiar with danko jones yeah 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 he does the uh the choruses with mick and okay. uh, breakdown cool very cool that, man. that was kind of like a cool I, I love both those bands and of course sammy's part of the family so right on well one more time the album is crate digging it is jet boy and um billy it's been fun talking to you and um i guess it's been fun talking to everybody because that's going to wrap it up for this episode of chris aiken presents but we will be back next week and um billy i figure we'll wrap it up by uh giving people a taste of Lido shuffle um yeah. give us uh give us uh some insight on what made you choose that song uh you know what it could have been one of the picks that i had i don't know boss kags is from the bay you know he i don't know if he's from the bay area but he grew up you know he was broke out of the bay area so sure. that's where from so it's a bit of an ode to a a, a hometown hero but grow, we grew up on this song it's just it's just one of those things that was huge on the radio and it's a great song absolutely well, let's play it right now it is uh jet boy with Lido shuffle right here on chris aiken presents Mixed up shots and a needle put the money 